Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And I'm going to be discussing today with Michael Lloyd, a member of the Global Policy Institute and a former economic advisor to the European Parliament, um, the best way, if there is such a thing, uh, for the United Kingdom to rejoin the European Union, uh, and if so, on what time scale um, and by what um, route map. Uh, Michael, I think you are quite hopeful that in four or five years' time, it might be possible seriously to talk about rejoining the single market. Um, can you explain why you think that so, uh, and how you think that will pan out um, in the wider context of a possibility of Britain rejoining the European Union? I would rather say that it's, um, it's, it's a possibility, particularly given the economic context context and how that will develop between the UK and the EU and how that will develop over time. I mean, uh, it, in a sense, we, we're in a strange situation at the moment because although the trade and cooperation agreement uh, was signed uh, at the end of 2020, it really wasn't fully developed. I mean, effectively what happened was they just stopped negotiating and decided that that was it. Uh, and it shows because of lots of loose ends in the TCA. But generally speaking, I think the problem that the UK has in economic terms, and I, I, I think many people would agree, that in separating ourselves off from the uh, EU, and in particular the EU Single Market and Customs Union, that that actually is, is an enormous disadvantage in trade terms and GDP terms, growth terms, to the UK. Uh, the estimates uh, uh, are vary, but the one that I prefer is one which says, suggests we will use some, we'll lose something like 2.6% GDP of, of, of economic development and welfare. Now, the attempt to make that up by going for deals with Australia or Japan, the US, will in no way make up for that. You'd have to have something like uh, 40 J J Japan or US agreements to make up for the 2.6% loss in terms of what we lose from uh, leaving a... a major market and that will be you can discount that a little bit because obviously we will still we will still be trading with the eu um, but increasingly it's going to be it's going to be made difficult uh, and more costly because one thing people don't seem to realize is that the rules of origin where you to, the, any kind of trade between the uk and the eu uh, has to have uh, clear involvement of either UK produce or EU produce and not third country produce and dealing with that I won't go into the sort of detail of the rules of origin because it's obviously complicated um, but at the end of this year then um, you that has to be made pretty clear by companies who are trading what exactly the position is there's a little bit more leeway uh, to some extent in terms of the uh, car industry, the automobile industry, uh, because the 55% UK or EU content applicable to most goods uh, is graduated and it's not until the end of uh, 2006 that that fully applies to the uh, automobile industry. But generally speaking, that will create problems and raise costs. So by the end of this year, we should see some impact. The impact is to some extent muted now because of the because of COVID and the recovery from COVID, which again will confuse the statistics, certainly in terms of growth, because there will be a surge uh, in the UK, there will be a recovery of growth. So it won't be, it'll be really in 1920, 22, sorry, 2022, 2022. <laughs> that, um, that we will um, uh, begin to see the impacts. And then finally, I think uh, at this point, we can discuss it further in terms of questions. My, my view is that the economic damage will become clearer and clearer. And at the end of 2000, in four years time, 
the Northern Ireland Protocol, which of course puts the uh, Northern Ireland's remaining in the uh, internal market, the single market, with all the difficulties that that is currently producing, uh, will have to be reviewed. It could be ended. I don't think it will be, because I think during that period, it will be seen to have benefited Northern Ireland uh, and not be detrimental to it uh, once the DUP takes its head out of the sand and recognises the benefits. And that, I think, is a point at which um, it, it is possible that we may think that the rest of the UK should actually be part of the single market, which, of course, was one of the original uh, ideas floated during the negotiations. Um, can you set that in a context of um, a longer period of possibly rejoining the European Union um, and comment on whether you think there should be campaigning or advocacy now of immediately rejoining the European Union or doing it at least as soon as possible? No, I don't think we should. I, 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 we, we're going to disagree on this. I don't think one should be campaigning, uh, campaigning now to rejoin. I think what, what we should be doing is looking at the impact of Brexit and constantly uh, reminding people that this is, was a mistake uh, and the economic damage that's been done needs to be recognised uh, and uh, be commented on by politicians and economic commentators. I mean, the FT, to be fair, does a good job on this. Um, and there was a piece by Martin Wolf, I think, yesterday. Uh, yesterday, and there have been other pieces, and I think that's the right way to do it, to be constantly criticising what is happening uh, and relating it to the Brexit decision. But I don't think we should be campaigning to rejoin at this point in time. Yes, I disagree with that, as you know. Can, can I set out why I disagree with it? Um, I, I think that the, the fundamental sin and problem of pro-Europeanism in this country um, has been the doctrine of unripe time. Uh, it's too early to do this, it's too early to do that, we'd better let events take their course. Uh, I saw it very clearly in the Conservative Party where a pro-European majority within the Conservative Party uh, allowed itself to be hijacked and displaced by what was initially uh, an anti-European minority because the pro-European majority always thought that now is not the time to take a stand. It's a very um, seductive, but it's a very dangerous co um, concept. Um, the uh, UKIP and the anti-European forces um, always thought that it was the right time to take a stand, um, and they've been justified eventually in their success from, through Brexit. Um, more importantly, I think that uh, the, the referendum and the loss of the referendum was another example of the doctrine of unright time. Um, everybody, on all sides of the political spectrum have been very uh, timid and very hesitant in making the case for the European Union. Um, and they thought they would be able at the last um, six weeks um, to make a case, um, which they hadn't made in the previous 15 or 20 years. Um, it, it's always later than you think. Um, and in my view, it's, it's rarely too early to, um, to, to start campaigning for something you want to, to, have to bring about. Uh, I think there's a, a further aspect to this, which is that uh, uh, an absolute failure of the remain of the pro-European forces before 2016 was to explain the necessity and desirability of sovereignty sharing through the institutions of the European Union. That wasn't explained. Everything that was sovereignty sharing was written off as federalism. We don't want that. We are going to be um, marginal. Um, uh, uh, members of the European Union, we are not going to involve ourselves fully in the European Union. Um, and the logical conclusion was drawn of that um, in 2016. Well, if we're so doubtful about the whole principle of the European Union, why don't we get out of it entirely? Uh, and I'm afraid I don't see any possibility in 2024 or 2025 um, of being able to reverse that narrative simply by economic considerations. Uh, I think that if there were to be some question of joining the single market in 2024, 2025, there would have to be a political narrative associated it, with it, which was one of sovereignty sharing. Um, and that is the essence of being in the European Union. Um, if you're getting to make the case for proper sovereignty sharing through the European Union, then you might as well rejoin the European Union rather than simply do it on the basis of joining the single market 
on less favorable terms than we have at the moment, because we would be uh, outside the door, we will be outside the negotiating chamber, the Eurosceptics will be right in saying that we'll be rule takers rather than rule makers. So I don't think that that is a, a, a flyer. I think that there's a much more intellectually coherent position, which is to say that we should rejoin and re resume our full place within the European Union. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not even saying it would definitely be successful. But what I am saying is that if you want to rejoin, that is the best path to go down. One final point. I don't think that Brexit um, is, is simply a policy like any other. Um, it's something which is um, uh, destroying and de degrading and destroying much in our contemporary political culture. It's something which is based on lies and fantasy, and it has to be sustained by lies, lies and fantasy. One of the most worrying aspects of our, our present political situation um, is that there is a complete indifference uh, in many, many quarters, in the media, um, in public opinion even, to the lies, um, the mendacity, particularly um, of the leading figures within the government. People shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's what politicians do. Uh, there's a, an unhappy authoritarian drift in this government, uh, which I think um, in three or four years time can bring us much closer to where, than where we are now, um, to being in a Polish or a Hungarian situation. And I don't think um, that that can be divorced from Brexit um, and the corrosion, the abandonment of moral standards that it's brought with it. Um, and I think to say that we might rejoin the single market in four years time is, is not a morally or politically adequate response um, to this jeopardy, um, to democracy in our country uh, and to the unity of the United Kingdom. So I think it's rather later and rather more urgent than you allow. And I'm not sure that the prescription that you have is one which is saleable. Well, I am not going to disagree with the final point that you made. I think that's absolutely true. Um, and it is extremely worrying. Uh, the way in which governance is moving in this country is becoming more authoritarian. Uh, it's, allow it's allowable because of the rather rickety constitution which we have, which effectively goes back to the 17th century. So I don't disagree with your final point at all. I think it's extremely worrying. The, um, I, I want to set your view in a historical context. But first of all, just a remark on sovereignty. Again, I agree with you on sovereignty. And I think people make the mistake of trying to transfer sovereignty uh, in the context of an individual nation state, where clearly sovereignty is, is fairly explicable as to what it is. There is a sovereign. It happens in the UK to be the queen in parliament or rather the representatives of the Queen in Parliament, which is the government and principally the Prime Minister. Um, but in an international context, and particularly if you're looking at trade deals, it is utterly meaningless. <laughs> you, 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 you always surrender a degree of sovereignty if one nation state is agreeing with other nation states, either collectively as we did within the EU or even in bilateral trade agreements with Australia or the US or, or, or Japan. And it'll be certainly fairly obvious in relation to the any, any any future trade agreement with the US, which I think is a bit doubtful at the moment. Um, but I want to set what you said, and I said in in an historical context. I joined the European Commission in 1973, initially in in uh, DG Research, but I was transferred to the UK almost immediately, um, and it was my job to liaise with because of my background. I, I've been working for the TUC, I was an economist, um, and uh, I, my job was to actually liaise with the trade union movement and the Labour Party. And at that point in time, it was the reverse of what we have now. It, the Labour Party that had a significant uh, group of people uh, opposed to uh, the uh, EU and in fact, arguing that we, we should never have joined the EU. Although at that point in time, it was the common market. And indeed, uh, that, 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 that was how, how it was looked at as an economic uh, decision. Given well, that was a fantasy. Concept. That was a fantasy, wasn't it? It was always a fantasy, a British fantasy. 
I agree that it was a fantasy, but I'm sorry, that is how it was defined. That was how it was discussed. Now, in, as working for the European Commission between 17 and 75, and dealing with the Labour Party and the trade unions, but also dealt with business uh, and with uh, uh, local authorities in particular, because we spent a lot of time then, and I did, certainly traveling around the country, um, speaking at meetings, political meetings as well, uh, and basically informing people. And we put out quite a lot of information. We had uh, lots of debates and discussions. We took people over to Brussels to introduce them and convince them that this, not, this wasn't something that, that, that we should be frightened of. But it was also uh, an opportunity to point out the political nature of the EU and the uh, desire of the EU in the fullness of time to move to considerably more integration than was the case uh, in 1973. So that, 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 that was the situation. And of course, the referendum which took place uh, in 1975, and which, as I say, I was very much in, involved with, uh, obviously had a two-thirds majority in favour of Britain staying within the EU. It's interesting in terms of the European Commission office that in the uh, 2016 referendum, um, the staff were not allowed to move out of their office. Whereas in 73, as I say, I travel around the country speaking at meetings, including uh, political meetings. Um, that's just to say that, that the pro-European forces um, suffered a regression intellectually between 1973 and 2016. Um, there was more concern um, that we should uh, isolate ourselves from um, European influences, um, which even the supposed yes campaign um, fell prey to. Um, how do you ac account for that? And do you think that it's going to be um, different if you tried to join the single market in 2024? No, I think there's a different historical context from 1975 onwards, and that is that the British establishment, and I don't just mean the political establishment, I mean the administrative establishment as well, the elites, none of them, none of them were willing to spell out what the EU was, and the British public were never told. Uh, what the agenda was, why we agreed to certain things. They were never told how influential the UK was within the councils of Europe. Um, so that, that inability of the public to recognise what was happening and to recognise or not to be able to recognise the positive aspects. Although, ironically, Margaret Thatcher, as you recall, um, pushed the idea via Lord Crowfield, who was the uh, commissioner, but the UK commissioner at the time, pushed the idea of the internal market. She, she was just point the out, main drivers of that. Well, she, she, her role is overstated in British mythology on that, but she was a contributor to it. Um, but the interesting thing was that she fell out with Cofield because Cofield realised that the single market was based on further sovereignty sharing. And she refused to accept that. She had this idea that the single market will be an absence of regulation. You wouldn't need to share any sovereignty. Um, whereas, of course, it was common regulation that made the single market work. And Cofield realised that, and she, she refused to realise the implications of what she'd done. She was a, a precursor of Boris Johnson in that way, that she refused to recognise the implications of what she'd signed up to. I don't think that's entirely true, frankly. Uh, I think the government as a whole, including Margaret Thatcher, who I'm, well, I'm not a fan of Margaret Thatcher, as you know. Uh, but um, uh, no, I think she recognised that. She didn't. What, what, what she didn't recognise and what Kofu did was, you, you're quite right, that if you go beyond that, and indeed that the single market is the basis of going further meant that you were going to uh, uh, share further sovereignty. I had the definition of sovereignty, if you're dealing with an alliance of nations or a confederation or a federation, doesn't really matter, you, there is a sharing of sovereignty. And he did recognize that. I mean, most of the, I would say pretty well all of the UK commissioners not quite sure about the last one, but uh, seem to uh, uh, go native, uh, as, as, um, as, as Thatcher and Teddy would have described it, um, but in fact did appreciate 
uh, the benefits of that sharing of sovereignty. So yeah. you're right there. So. Why would it be possible, in your view, to develop a narrative um, in 2024 for joining the single market that wasn't much more applicable and even more applicable to rejoining the European Union? Because I'm going back to 1973, 1975. Uh, where the success was really in terms of the economic arguments with a, a kind of political flavour. I mean, I, I remember debating with, with, with uh, Wedgwood Ben, as he was then, and, and arguing that the EU system was actually more democratic than the, uh, the UK uh, so-called democratic system. And I still believe that, actually. Um, but um, uh, I think, in other words, we start off from the... We've got to start again. Uh, from the economic arguments, and don't, you, might, you won't, may not personally recall, but certainly the lead up to 1973, uh, over, over at least a decade, was very much determined by the economic, argument, economic arguments. We go back to the economic arguments and then gradually, but it'll be much faster at this, this time, if we do get back into the single European market, which I think is feasible if we join the European economic area, which we'd have to do anyway, um, and we'd have to join join uh, with uh, uh, join the EFTA group. Uh, then uh, I think we can then gradually deploy uh, the political arguments. I mean, we would need after the rejoining the SEM um, to then look at the cust uh, joining the customs unit. That would be more difficult. Um, but I think also uh, the, the fear that people have had during the past 40 odd years has been of this super state. But that super state uh, was, was always a, a myth. It was never a super state. It was always going to be a collective endeavor. And I think if that's what we need to convince people of in political terms. More than that, we need to convince them that it's based on sovereignty sharing. Of course, it's not a super state, but it is involved on defined amounts of sovereignty sharing. And unless you have that firmly in mind, then you're not going to persuade, it seems to me, the British people to re re rejoin the single market um, or rejoin the EU. But if you can persuade them of the merits of sovereignty sharing, the necessity of sovereignty sharing uh, for a middle-sized uh, island off the northwest coast of, um, uh, of the European landmass, um, then you might just as well be in for a penny and in for a pound to join the, rejoin the European Union. I, I think the idea that we can edge back into the European Union is a misplaced one, and that I think is the difference between us. No, I think you missed the point, really. The, you, you are sharing sovereignty if you go back into the uh, single European market, not in and, and in the way that the, the, the those who uh, the Brexiteers uh, don't like, which is the European mm -hmm. Court of Justice. You would be subject, as Northern Ireland is to the European Court of Justice if, if there are problems and, and, and people raise issues with, with, the, um, uh, with, with the ECJ. Final question. Um, the whole question of rejoin is sometimes put in the context of what the likely reaction of our European partners would be. Do you have any thoughts on that? Would they welcome <laughs> back uh, as full members or indeed as members of, uh, of EEA? Um, I think as members of the internal market of the single European market, I, I don't think there'd be a problem, problem because obviously there's damage to them as well, and particularly to countries like Ireland. I think in political terms, I, if, if I were them, I'm not sure I would want the, want the British back. But no, I think they would be happy to do that over time, which is why I think a pragmatic approach and concentrating initially on the economic benefits of rejoining the single European market for the whole of the UK rather than uh, Northern Ireland is, is I think, a, a, a genuine political way forward. Yes. Um, it used to be said that the Foreign Office only had two pieces of advice to minister. It's ministers, it's too early to say, it's too late to do anything about it. Uh, the idea that it's too early to press for rejoin is one that psychologically and temperamentally I, I find um, difficult to swallow. And I'm not sure it isn't the pragmatic way because um, pragmatism is only justified, it seems to me, if it's worked. And I'm not sure that our tactics, the pro-EU sized tactics within the European Union um, have worked particularly well over the past 50 years. But no, I think the problem is that you've got this, this problem as I in, 
indicated earlier, that the British people have never been properly briefed. The trouble is you've got to start again. And, and it is a pragmatic solution, I think, to get back into the single European market. What counts as pragmatic is often in the eye of the beholder. So we'll disagree about what pragmatism is, but thank you very much. And uh, that's the, the end of the debate. And I'm sure it's a debate that will continue to rumble on. Between the two of us as well. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. That's right.